All right. I want to talk this morning a little bit. Uh, we're going to be reading from the book of Joshua. And uh, remember last week I was talking about fear, how fear has torment. How many people know what I'm saying? When you hear that word cancer, that brings fear. You can't help it. I don't care how saved you are. When you hear that word, that's, that's scary. When you hear uh, things happening in the news and, and with the economy and they're talking about this happening and that happening in North Korea and Iran and all this other stuff, you'd like sometimes to get scared. But I'm here to tell you that that kind of fear is natural when you get scared like that. But I'm here to tell you you don't have to be afraid because we have a God who's bigger than all those things. And all through the scriptures we read, we see the, the phrase, fear not. Fear not. Be strong and courageous, what we're going to read today. Fear not. Now, I want to ask you this. For those of you who are saved, and hopefully you're all saved, hopefully you all know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. How many can have this testimony? When I first got saved, when I first came to know Christ and put my faith and trust in the blood of Jesus, I, man, I, it was like I'll have victory after victory. How many know what I'm talking about? Man, you're walking, man, it's, it, you're walking in the Spirit, Right? Victory over sin, man, things are just going good, and everything's going good, and all of a sudden, something blindsides you, like with a two-by-four, boom. How many know what I'm talking about? And how many can say, you don't have to put your hand up, how many can actually say, in their, in their experience of being a born-again believer, how many can actually say that there have been times in your walk that you've questioned whether or not you're really saved? Where you've questioned and said, man, am I really? God, have I, did I really hear from you? Don't feel bad. John the Baptist did that. When he was in prison, he said, Jesus, are you really the one? So we all go through that sometimes. But I'm here to tell you that that's kind of like normal. We need to learn how to overcome those things. Because Satan, if, he gets, if, he gets, if you give him just a crack in the door, he'll jump in there and he'll make you think like you're worse than the worst person you can think of. But I thank God for the blood of Jesus that cleansed me from all my sin. All of it. If I happen, if tomorrow I sin, I'm cleansed from it. That's not a blank check for me to go do whatever I feel like doing. But I'm cleansed from it. And what I want to do this, this morning is look a little bit in the book of Joshua. Because what the book of Joshua is about is conquering the promised land. Now you know the story. Uh, Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt through the wilderness. A few weeks ago, maybe a few months ago, we talked about when they came to the brink of their, of their blessing. After two years, after only two years, they were ready to march in. But they sent spies in there. They sent 12 spies to look out the land. They came back, and the spies said, man, that's a great land, flowing with milk and honey. But 10 of the spies says, we can't do it because there's giants in there. There's walled cities, there's armies, there's powerful. We can't take them. And two of the spies, one's name was Joshua that we're going to read about here today, and the other one's name was Caleb. They said, wait a minute, what, look what God has done for us so far. He took us out of Egypt. He provided for us manna in the wilderness. He gave us all, you know, he did all these things. We saw all these miraculous works, water coming out of a rock. We can take them because it's not us. They're already defeated. God already promised us that we had the victory. But the people listened to the, 12, uh, the other 10 spies, and they wandered for another 40 years in the wilderness. Well, in the book of Joshua, we come to the end of that 40 years. Moses was dead, and Joshua was given the reins. I want you to read a little bit with me in Joshua chapter 1. It says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister. See, Joshua was like Moses' second-hand guy. He was like the one with Moses all the time, all right? And God said to Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people under the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Now, if you listen to some of the traditional songs that people sing in church, when they talk about crossing over Jordan, we usually perceive that as meaning, you know, going to heaven. I'm crossing, I'm, you won't have to cross Jordan alone. I'm bound for the promised land. We've heard all them songs, right? And that they always talk about, you know, when we die, we're going to go to the promised land. But listen, the promised land had nothing to do about dying. 
It has nothing to do with heaven. Because what we're going to find out, when Joshua went into the promised land, what was he going to have to do? He was going to have to fight. Conquer. When I go to heaven, I'm not going to have to fight anybody up there. I'm going to heaven. I'm not, I'm not going to have to toy. I, when I go to heaven, I want to rest. <laughs> I want to lay back. I'm not going to have any enemies up there. He ain't going to let them in. When crossing over into the promised land has nothing to do with dying and going to heaven. Crossing over the, into the promised land has to do with living the life that God wants you to live right here in the middle of this wicked and perverse generation. Because that's where they were going. They were going to a land that was filled with uh, Hittites and Amorites and all these other people who were wicked and practicing horrible things. And God told his people to go in there and drive them out and not have anything to do with them. And God was going to give them this promised land that was going to be flowing with milk and honey. And so the promised land had nothing to do with going to heaven. The promised land has to do with living right here. I ain't going to have any problems when I go to heaven. Now listen to what he says. He says in verse 3, Every place that the sole of your foot... Let's look, go back to verse 2. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. Every place. Can you say that? Every place. You know, as believers... God wants us to possess where we are. He wants, us, he, wants us, he wants to give us the land. He wants to give us the block. He wants to give us New Kensington. Not for our sake, but for his sake. It goes on and he says, From this wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, and the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. You know the land that God promised to the Israelites is not the nation of Israel there today? That's only part of it. When it's all said and done, they're going to have a whole lot more than that. Verse 5. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life, as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Kind of sounds like what Jesus said before he ascended. I will never leave you or forsake you. Huh? Now look what he says. Be strong and of a good courage. Now, some might, people might read that and think maybe Joshua was getting a little scared about going into the promised land. Oh, wait a minute. Forty years before that, he was one of the ones that said, we can do it. Listen, Joshua wasn't concerned. And as I read this, I don't believe Joshua was concerned about what was on the other side of the Jordan. He wasn't concerned about the folks that were in front of him that God had already conquered. He was, about, he was concerned about the folks that was with him. Because for 40 years, then people were stiff-necked, stubborn, complaining, rebellious, always giving Moses gray hairs. And Joshua would probably be thinking, man, <laughs> am I going to be able to put up with this bunch? Just my take on it. But he wasn't afraid of what was over on the other side of Jordan. Because he would, 40 years ago, man, he was ready to go. And he was ready to go right now. But God said, be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shall you divide an inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. He says it again. Only be strong and very courageous that thou mayst observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayst prosper whithersoever thy goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, and you, uh, that you might observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. He said, listen, the victory is already won. You just do what I tell you to do. Now, it's often said that we have three enemies in the world. Three enemies. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Right? That's, that's who I wrestle with. I don't know about you. Now listen, the devil, he's already defeated. He was defeated on Calvary. Man, he, was, he was cast down before that. When he tried to lift himself up and raise himself up like the Most High, God cast him down. Uh, that devil, how he could think that he could, he could be as great as his creator. He's already defeated. He's beaten. 
If you're in Christ, you don't have to be afraid of the devil. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying there's no devil. You know, there's, there's spiritual reality. Paul said we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places. I mean, spiritual stuff goes on all over the place. But it's defeated. We just have to move in Christ. He's defeated. The world, I got a problem with the world. I got a problem, you know, watching my eyes because the world's out there. But you know what Jesus said? He had overcome the world. He'd already overcome the world. If you're in Christ, you've overcome the world. In Christ, not in your own strength. So the devil and the world, they're already beaten. But you know what gives me the most problem? This stuff called flesh. The flesh has cravings. It craves. It desires. It wants. And I'm not just talking about our bodies. You know, we're, we're humans. We have bodies. We're going to have resurrected bodies someday. But the flesh is that nature in us that is never satisfied. It always wants more. It wants another piece of chocolate cake. Okay. That's my problem. <laughs> it has, we, the flesh is never satisfied. It wants more. And it wants more. Joshua, he knew the devil was defeated. He knew the land was his, but he knew he had a bunch of people behind him, maybe a million of them. I don't know how many there was. There was a bunch of people behind him that were constantly trying to feed their flesh. And every time they got out of God's will and started to feed their flesh, God had to send some kind of judgment to get them straightened out. Listen to what it says. Verse 9, have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. He's always with you. He's always there. As believers in Jesus Christ, we don't need to be afraid of what the devil's going to do because he's defeated. We don't need to be afraid of what the world system because he has overcome the world. What we need to be focused on is our flesh. The baggage that we carry with us. We got lots of it. Now, turn over a little bit. We, we know the story about Joshua. Turn over to... Uh, Chapter, chapter 6. Now, in Joshua chapter 6, we read the story about the conquest of Jericho. And, uh, well, let's just read a little bit this morning. It's not, it's not too late. Look, look at verse 1. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. Them folks in Jericho heard about these Israelites coming across the Jordan. They heard about what God did for them in the wilderness. They heard about what happened in Egypt 40 years before that. They heard about how they defeated all their enemies coming through the wilderness. So these people in Jericho, they were scared. See, we don't, we don't realize this. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this. And I hope this is anointed by the Holy Spirit. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this. Satan is terrified of you. If, you. if you walk, see, he loves to get Christians. You can go to church all you want to. You can sing and pray all you want to. But if, if, you, if you start moving and living in the Spirit, he's terrified of you. He wants to scare us. He wants to try to yell and scream. He's like a roaring lion. And he wants to scare us. But we can say, in the name of Jesus. They were scared. Because they knew what was coming. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into your hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty man of valor. And you shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shall you do six days. Six days, you're going to march around that city one time and go back. Well, I didn't learn that in West Point. That that doesn't make any sense. You want to conquer a city. Because God says, just do what I tell you to do. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day you shall compass the city seven times. When you go around the seventh day, you're going to walk around seven times with a priest blowing the shofar. Okay. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat. And the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. 
And Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priest, and uh, he gave them the, the, the marching orders there. Verse 8, And it uh, came to pass, when Joshua had spoken unto the people, that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns passed on before the Lord and blew the trumpets, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. Verse 9, And the armed men went before the priest and blew with the trumpets, and the rearward came after the ark, the priest going on and blowing with the trumpets. These people in Jericho probably figured, man, what is going on here? They're ready for the battle, I mean, and, they're, and they know it's going to be a battle. And they, all they're doing is blowing these horns and, and marching around. And Joshua, in verse 10, had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout nor make any noise with your voice, neither any word uh, shall any word proceed out of your mouth. Until that day I bid you shout, then you shall shout. Just imagine telling a million people to keep our mouth shut. And we have trouble doing it with five, you know. It's just, we said, don't say anything. Don't say a word. Don't hum, don't whistle, just walk, march, walk. Can you just imagine them people in Jericho seeing a million people march around their city not making a sound? Okay. Look at verse 12. And Joshua arose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark, and seven priests bearing seven tr trumpets of ram's horns, before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew with the trumpets and the armed men went before them. But the rearward came after the ark uh, of, the, of the Lord, the priests going on blowing with the trumpets. Verse 14. And the second day, uh, they compassed the city once and returned and so forth. Uh, and if, if you look at verse 16. And it came to pass at the seventh time when the priests blew the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Can you shout because the Lord has given us the city? Hallelujah. Shout. Okay. And the city shall be accursed. Now listen, listen to what he says in verse 17. The city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein, to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live. And, and that's because she had faith to believe that God was going to do what he said he was going to do. And that's, that's another message. Uh, she and all that are with her in the house because she hid the messengers that we sent. And ye in any wise. Now listen. Keep yourselves from the accursed thing. Don't touch anything. There's gold in that city, there's silver, there's riches, there's wealth. Don't touch it. Any other place they went, they were allowed to take plunder. But he said, listen, this is the first city in the promised land. This is mine. This is what God is saying. It's mine. Don't touch it. He says, you shall in any wise keep yourself from the accursed thing, lest you make yourselves accursed. When you take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. You know what I found? When I first got saved, there were some things that God wanted from me. And I learned, unless, until I was willing to give God everything he wanted, I wasn't going any further than my obedience would allow me to go. Man, we want to move on with God. We want to, we want to get right off. We want, we want God to move, and we want to see the power of God and everything. Maybe, listen, we'll never go any further than our obedience or disobedience. Now, it says, where was I? Okay, look at verse 19. But the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. They're mine. So the people shouted when the priest blew the trumpet, and it came to pass. What happened? The walls came tumbling down. Praise the Lord. Yeah, yeah give the Lord a hand clap. That's right. It's all right. I want to see some walls come tumbling down. Okay. The walls came tumbling down. Okay. I should have sang that song this morning. All right. Now, look, just drop down to verse uh, 26. And Joshua adjured them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord that rises up and builds the city Jericho. He shall lay the foundation thereof, and his firstborn and his youngest shall he set up the gates. So the Lord w was with Joshua, and his fame was noised throughout all the country. Everybody heard about what happened to Jericho. And they got to shaking in their boots. I said, man. They never fired a shot. All they did was kept, they kept their mouth shut for six days, and the seventh day they shouted, and that was it. It's amazing what God can do, isn't it? Now look at chapter 7. See, this is great, man. They're rolling. Wow, victory, great victory. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. 
One of them, it just took one out of the million, or however many there were. For Achan, the son of Carmi, no relation, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled not against him, but against the whole camp. See, some folks think when they go dabbling with a sin, it just affects them. But you know what? It affects the body. When a member of the body, and when I say the body, I'm not just talking about a particular congregation, but the church in general. You know what happens when a Christian leader falls and what kind of stuff you got to listen to when you go to work the next day? We've been through that. But even when an individual, do you know how many times, you know, I've, I've talked to people and witnessed to people and they say, yeah, I knew so-and-so, he was a Christian and uh, he ripped me off with, I mean, how many have heard that kind of, that kind of uh, response? Do we understand that we have a responsibility as individuals to bear the name of Jesus Christ, to carry his name? Listen, it says this, verse 2. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai. Now, Ai was the next city. Here was Jericho and Ai was the next one. Ai was nothing. Ai was like, you know, Markle. Okay. Nothing against Markle. Okay. It was just a little village. It was like nothing. And they figured, man, Jericho, the walls came tumbling down. Ai, we'll brush them off with nothing. They was, they was, they was riding high. Great victory. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside beth Aven, on the east side of Bethel, and spoke unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua, and they said unto him, Push over. Piece of cake. We don't got to take the whole army. Let about two or 3,000 men go up and smite Ai. We got it. We got it covered. No problem. So there went up thither of the people, about 3,000 men. And when they got to Ai, they ran. They, they had to flee. They tried to fight a battle. But nothing worked. They went up, confident because they had such a great victory in, in Jericho. But when they came to Ai, this little village in the middle of nowhere, he sent them packing like some scared dogs. This is what happened. Verse 5. And the men of Ai smote of them about 36 men, for they chased them from, from before the gate even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down, wherefore the hearts of the people. When that happened, when they found out that their, 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 their exploratory uh, force came back and they got beaten by these, this, these nobodies from Ai, their heart melted. Have you ever been there? Have you ever sensed defeat in your life as a believer? When you felt like somehow something wasn't working right, or you missed something, or you got blindsided with a two-by-four somewhere, everything, man, you're walking in victory, and all of a sudden, pow. It says in verse 6, that Joshua, the mighty, be strong and courageous Joshua, he rent his clothes, and he fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening tide. He and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. They were saying, God, what happened? You told us we would, uh, every place we go, every place where our feet walked would be ours. You told us that nobody would be able to stand up against us. You told us that everything we would do, would, we, would, we would prosper, and we would be successful. You told us we would have victory, that the land was ours. Now, this little bunch of people from nowhere beat my army up, sent, sent them packing, killed some of them. And Joshua said, in verse 7, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan? He's starting to sound like that, that bunch back in the wilderness who were complaining about not having garlic. You remember that? They were complaining about what they had to eat, man. They got tired of eating, man. He sounded like that bunch that were afraid to go over because there were giants in the land. Now he's saying, God, why did you bring us here? 
You brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Listen to Joshua. Here's big, brave, and strong and courageous Joshua saying, God, did you bring us here to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. The same thing they said back in the wilderness. We should have stayed in Egypt. I hope nobody here has ever said that. Not seriously. Do you really think things were better back in the world before you knew Christ? Do you really think things were better back there? Now listen. He says, O Lord, in verse 8, what shall I say when Israel turns their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall environ us, they'll surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do unto your great name? God, what are we going to do now? They hear about we had this defeat. And the Lord said unto Joshua, get up, get up. Wherefore do you lie upon your face? What, Joshua? Now notice something. When they decided they were going to go to Ai, did God tell them to go to Ai? No. They just figured, hey, that's the next one in line. I guess that's what God wants us to do. God says, Joshua, why are you lying on your face before me? You probably should have done that before you went to Ai, Joshua. You probably should have prayed first. You ever been there with, you know, do act first and pray later? It should be the other way around. If you pray first, it usually turns out a whole lot better than if you act first and pray. Because if you pray first and say, oh, God, what would you have us do? And he'll tell you what to do and you'll be victorious. Or if you act first, then you've got to pray, oh, God, what happened? Now, look, the Lord says, Israel has what? Sin. And they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing, and they have also stolen and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own. You know, God didn't say he did it. He said they did it. I'm really convinced that the reason why the church in the United States of America is so powerless because we have too much sin. Too much unrepented of. Too much unpreached about. Too much unexamined. We got sin. We cover it up with, you know, pep rallies that we call revivals. We cover it up with politics. We cover it up with anything we can to make it look and sound good and make ourselves sound popular. But there's too much sin in the camp. That's why we don't see the power that we'd like to see. Not because God can't do it. God can do anything. He says, verse 12, Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you anymore, except you destroy the accursed. Listen, this is serious. Because we run into it as believers. We're washed, we're covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. We're saved. But we run into a dead end when we disobey God. We run into a dead end when we allow that little piece of that little piece of flesh to remain, oh Lord, I surrender all except for this. If you read the story, they had to go through a big long procedure to identify who the culprit was. And they found out it was this fellow named Achan. And in verse 21 of Joshua chapter 7, it says, when they ask Achan, what did you do? It says, when I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them. Then I coveted them. See, our problem is we have so much and you know, the more stuff we have, the more stuff we want. We covet. I put my hand up. Don't, I don't want anybody to think I'm pointing a finger at you. I put my hand up. We, there, we want more. We, we worship the goddess called more. And we want more. And we come to church and we praise God. And I believe we praise God with all our hearts and soul. But we have that little 
piece of flesh, sometimes maybe it's not so little, that thing it, that grinds inside of us. Look, look with me one place in the New Testament, and I'm going to be closing. It's quiet. It's a quiet morning. So. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Listen, first, first Timothy. I'm uh, yeah, first Timothy. Chapter chapter six. Look at this. Look at this. There are so many places I could, I could go about, but we'll go here. The apostle Paul writing to Timothy says this. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. What he's saying, in those days, in the Roman Empire, in Paul's day, slavery was like an institution. And Paul was in no wise... Uh, you know, saying slavery was a good thing. It was just a fact of life in the Roman Empire. And it wasn't a racial thing. When we think in, in our nation about s- slavery, we think of the racial thing. But in, in that time, it wasn't. And there were, there were Christian slave owners and Christian slaves. It was just a fact of life. And what Paul is telling the ones who were Christian slaves to, to, be, uh, to honor your master, especially if they're a Christian too. Some of us might have trouble wrapping our minds around that, but that's, that was just the way things were. A lot of these slaves were people who were, uh, you know, captured in various campaigns, and they were sold into slavery. They weren't, like, you know, necessarily out in the field digging, but they would be household slaves. Some of them would be tutors. They would, be, they would teach the children. They would be like nannies. So he's saying to the slave, something is foreign to us. They said, if your master is a Christian, respect him even more. And listen to what he says. Now today, we don't have that situation, but today we have what? Employees and employers. I worked for 33 years in Allegheny Ludlam Steel Corporation. I can be very honest with you. There were some of my foremen it was very difficult to be respectful of. Even after I, before I was saved, man, it wasn't even a contest. But even after I was saved, I had, all right, but now listen to what he says. Verse 3, if any man teach otherwise, there's a lot of places I could have went, but I went here. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, wherefore comes envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. One of the, the poison of the body of Christ is that somehow we got this idea that the more money we got, the more faith we got, or vice versa. I've, I've, we've heard it, lived in it, dealt with it. We want more. We, we live in a culture that wants more. Feed the flesh. But here's what Paul says. And we're going to close with this. And somebody's going to say, thank the Lord. But godliness with contentment. It's great gain. We find ourselves, I found myself in my life, beaten up by the devil. Pastor Harold says, devil, eat your lunch. Why? Because he's more powerful than my God? No. Why? Because he's a, he has something on me? No. Because when I turn my back and turn my eyes from what God has said in his word and I put my eyes on stuff just like Achan saw that piece of gold and he saw that piece of silver and he saw that good looking three piece Babylonish suit. He says, hey, God ain't going to miss that. I'll just swipe it in and hide it and 
In a couple months when everybody forgets about it, I pull it out and I say, Hey, Aiken, where'd you get that good-looking suit? You know. How many people know you can't, you can't lie to God? You might, you might make yourself look good to everybody else, but you can't lie to God. See, I'm talking to believers now. When you get blindsided, when you find yourself on the wrong end of everything, when I find myself on the wrong, when I find myself getting burned out and depressed and weighed down, you know, I need to take a good look in the mirror and say, what have I, what have I set my hands on I shouldn't set my hands on? What have I covered it? What have I put my heart to that I should not have put my heart to? Victory is in the blood of Jesus. <laughs> That's... I don't have to work for my salvation, Brother Jairus. It's, it's a free gift. It's given to me. That's something to rejoice. But the Apostle Paul said this. He said, work out your salvation with how? With fear and trembling. It's serious. The world is looking at you. This world out here that we want to win for Christ, they're looking at you. They're looking at me. Anybody that names the name of Jesus says, I'm a believer. Whenever you go out and witness to somebody, hand, they're looking at you. They want, to see, they want to see how you act. They want to see how you react. Sometimes they'll go out of their way to see how you react. I learned that. <laughs> yeah, they'll... They'll find out how saved you are. See, here's the thing. Jesus said, just like God told Joshua, be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. But don't let my law depart from your mouth. Don't let that, that, that Holy Spirit that you have inside of you, Christian, don't, let, don't ignore the leadings. Don't ignore the promptings. Listen to God. Learn how to sense his presence. Learn how to discern when he's speaking to you. It might not be a voice. It might be. But most of the time, it's that check. It's that I've been there where there have been things that I've set out to do, and, and the Holy Spirit inside of me said, no. Didn't tell me why. Made sense. Things, well, this makes sense. The Holy Spirit says, no. And there were even times where I would beg God. <laughs> you ever do that? You seen something you wanted? And you say, God, God. And God would say, you don't need that. God, God, I want, God, oh, God, I beg, beg. Sometimes God will say, okay. And he let me have what I begged for. And it wasn't long after that that I was saying, oh, God, please forgive me. <laughs> I was begging for his forgiveness. You learn. You learn. Because he never leaves us or forsakes us. Amen. I want to ask you this morning. We're going to close in prayer. If you're here this morning and you know. And you know. That you're, you're at a place in your life where it seems like you've hit a dead end or a brick wall. You can't go any further. Believers. If you're not a believer, I encourage you to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. That we can have that faith. We can have that victory promised to us. He's promised us the victory. But if you're a believer and you find yourself in a dead end, I want to ask you this morning to pray this prayer with me. Father, show me the accursed thing. See, I don't want you to show me. It's really none of my business what your accursed thing is. But I want to pray that God would show you that see, see, we have we have one thing over when we read about Achan in the Old Testament. See, we have one thing over him. We have the cross. We have the blood. We can come boldly to the throne of grace and seek forgiveness. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to what? Forgive us and cleanse us from unrighteousness. So we don't have to be afraid of being covered with a pile of stones like Achan was. But when we go to him and we confess, you know what? He'll restore us. He'll renew us. He'll make us the people we want to be. People he wants us to be. But he wants us to be honest with him. 
I want to ask you this morning. I'm going to pray. You pray this with me where you're sitting, if, if you want. If not, that's okay. That's up to you. Father, in the name of Jesus, show me my accursed thing. Father, I, some of us probably know what it is. But, Father, I pray, Lord, we want to come to the throne of grace this morning and ask you, Lord, to forgive us. Father, we release to you today that thing that we've held on to that has kept us from being the people of God you want us to be. And, Father, I believe your word tells us that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Father, we're confessing to you this morning that sin that so easily besets us. Father, each and every one of us could probably name something a little different, but you know each and every one of us by name. You knew us before we were formed in our mother's womb. Father, I pray, Lord, you would allow your grace and your mercy to move and work in our lives and in our hearts. Father, that we would surrender to you that accursed thing, that we might move on in victory as we, as we have victory after victory. If, Father, you have promised us the promised land, this life in Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit. You said you were going to send another comforter Father, I'm afraid some of us, we've kept that Holy Spirit in a box too long. We've kept him in a box of disobedience, a box of covetousness, a box of... Father, we pray that we would allow the Holy Spirit to begin a work in our lives to save us and change us, conform us into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. Won't you stand with me, saints, as we close? Well, I... I, I, I really, you know, when I was looking at the message this morning, I didn't know it was going to come out quite like that, but maybe it needed to. Maybe it needed to for me. Hallelujah. Father, as we prepare to leave this place, listen, I, I always say this. If you need prayer, if you've never been born again and you want to be saved, please come up front. After, you know, we're going to dismiss and folks can leave and but if you need prayer for anything, please don't leave. I usually go back and shake a few hands, and I'll come back in. Please kind of hang out on the front pew, and we'd love to pray with you. Brother Jairus is here. Uh, we would love to pray with you. My, my wife, please don't leave without getting prayer if you need it. Father, as we prepare to leave this place, but not your presence. Father, you've heard the request, the prayer needs that we have uttered this morning. and We pray again for all those who are needy for those who are in need of healing, for those who are in need of financial blessing, Father, whatever it might be. But most of all, Lord, we pray that you would make us, help us, show the world who you are. Father, and every one of us in here, including the person standing behind this pulpit, got things that we need to bring to the cross. We're all human. We all have this flesh. But, Father, I want to be able to say, like the Apostle Paul, I am crucified with Christ. Therefore, I no longer live, but Jesus Christ now lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Father, help us live that life that you want us to live. There's a little song we sing. All to Jesus I surrender.